Welcome back to our class on machine translation. Today we're gonna take a second look at uh, deep learning. Um, previously we kind of introduced it from a more mathematical perspective and worked through all the derivatives. And now we're also gonna take a look at a fairly simple neural network, but we're gonna frame it in the term of the concept of a computation graph, which then also leads us into how our modern machine learning toolkits used to implement them and use them. And we're actually gonna go through uh, code examples, how the simple neural networks that we introduced last time is implemented in PyTorch. So here is our neural network cartoon we had. That's a fairly common way to illustrate neural networks. It's a little bit deficient because we don't really say what's happening inside the nodes and what the errors actually mean. Um, so we always have to also specify the uh, computations that we do, uh, the activation functions, and the nature of the weight matrices separately. So this is how we have to also specify mathematically what the computations are. Another way to view a neural network is uh, through a computation graph. So here we just really spell out all the different elements that go into a neural network. So it starts with the input here, and then we have a bunch of parameters here, the first layer, weight matrix and bias term, and then the second layer, weight matrix and bias term. And what do we do? We first do a product, so this is multiplying x with the weights. That's kind of carrying out the weighted sum for each element in the output vector. Then we add in the bias term. Then is we have the activation function that operates on each element of the vector we have there. And then the same thing repeats for the second layer. So it just spells out very explicitly what the computations are. And once you kind of settled on this point of view, uh, you're also not really restricted to the kind of nature metaphor of neural networks as neurons combining and having dendrites and axons connecting signals from one, some neurons to others. We can put in any kind of mathematical operation that operates in vectors and uh, may do anything at, at all. Um, the only limitations we have is um, these must be functions that we can take the derivative of to enable uh, backpropagation training. So here's our simple neural network. Now actually annotate our computation graph with these values there. So instead of the previous annotation, now we have the computation graph annotation of this simple neural network, where we just write next to each parameter, uh, matrix or vector, uh, its actual values. Okay, so this makes it very straightforward how computation is done. Um, so we come in with uh, input value, so first thing is a product. So we multiply the vector in the matrix. That gives us this value here. So now in blue on the right, we write down uh, values for uh, when you carry out the computation on this particular input. And then we have the sum. So that just adds, for instance, 3.7 and minus 1.5 gives us 2.2. Here we have the sigmoid, so the sigmoid of 2.2 apparently is 0 0.900, and the sigmoid of minus 1.6 um, goes to 0 0.168. Um, just to remember, um, one of the big motivations of using functions like sigmoid is it takes inputs that go from minus infinity to plus infinity and puts them into a range of 0 to 1, which then kind of allows more manageable calculation and also has this behavior that there is a part in the middle where values matter. But for instance, the sigmoid for a million and the sigmoid for a billion is not all that different. Okay, 
then uh, here we basically repeat this now for another layer. So we have now this ve this vector here multiplied with the weight matrix, and then with this product here. So this weight matrix is now actually just a two point one two times one matrix. So we only get one value out. Add in the bias term and compute the sigma. So this is the calculation we do. And then one more thing we did in your networks is to figure out, OK, this is computed output here, 0.768. What is the error? So we really wanted to have one. So um, we have to have an explicit measure of how much the error works. And one error we introduced here was the L2 norm, which has nice mathematical properties um, in terms of it doesn't matter if if the number is too high or too low, we basically take uh, the count the same. Um, and also, we can very easily take the derivative. So um, remember now in gradient descent training, we view the error as a function of the trainable parameters. So error now is a function of the lambdas. So one way to view this is if you think, have this computation graph in your mind, you usually think about the input as being the vari variable that goes into the function. And now all the parameters are vari variables that go into the function. So these are the things you might change. So we want to optimize error by moving it towards optimum. So we see different training examples, and they have different errors, and they might indicate uh, different optimal values for each of the parameters. Um, so we're not going to overdo it for each individual training example. We just kind of nudge along how each training example is suggesting, and we do this by moving towards the gradient. Okay, so remember, we, why don't we just set it to its optimum is because we are updating based on one training example at a time, so we don't want to overfit to that one. And uh, the way we're doing our updates, we actually update each parameter in isolation. So once you change the, all the other parameters, the curve is actually going to look very different. So here's the workhorse that allows us to deal with computation graphs in a very efficient manner, and even allow computers to do all that heavy lifting for us of computing derivatives and all these backpropagation uh, computations that allow us to update parameters at any point in the computation graph. So it's the chain rule. Basically, the way you also can look at the computation graph is basically it chains together a lot of co computations. We have one function, then we kind of carry out another function, then we carry out another function, and so on and so on. So if you look at your old calculus books, you're going to find a rule like this here. Whenever you have a function combination, then this is the derivative. Or another way to put it, if you have this more complex function and you want to compute the derivative, it is the derivative of function f with the actual value of function g as input and the derivative of function g with this with the input value put in. Um, here's another notation here, Leibniz notation that looks like this. Uh, this is what we did last time a lot. So uh, this gives us the same kind of update rule. So the end result we have here is um, quite interesting for what we have to do. So at each given point in time, when we kind of walk, apply this chain rule to our whole computation chain, and we have a previous function g and a subsequent function f, at each given point in time, we have to take the derivative of the function g and apply it and see how it applies to its input value. That's one factor. And we multiply that with this here, which is where we take the value of the forward computation when g was applied to x and take that as value that we put into the derivative of um, 
the subsequent function uh, f. So there's always two things that get multiplied. Um, the one involves the derivative of the second function and one of the derivative. Recall how we applied this idea to the neural network we had last time. So this was here the final layer uh, where we actually went through the math of computing the error with respect to the weights. So here is where the weights come in. So we have first a linear combination of weights with the uh, values of the hidden vector. Then we applied the sigmoid function and then we computed an error. And the idea was to compute the error with respect to the weights. And what did we do? Well, we actually kind of followed back that computation path and first computed the error with respect to the output of the sigmoid, the prediction, then the, uh, the derivative of the uh, output of the, of the sigmoid with respect to the weighted sum that goes into it, and then here the derivative of the weighted sum with respect to the weights. So we basically applied the chain rule here. Um, and uh, that's uh, how we can also then apply it to a computation graph. So this is now the more general view of a computation graph. And what do we have to do there? So what kind of operations do we have to do to enable this kind of application of a chain rule? So let's just look at it, a very simple picture of the computation graph. So you have some kind of weight values here, and then you have two different function applications, B and E. And uh, you want to compute the derivative at node A, because that allows you then to do the updates to the parameter values at node A. So we have to compute the error with respect to A. So we'd have to do this for all the weights. For all the weights, you have to compute the error with respect to those weights. And what do we do? OK, there are two operations. So there are two uh, derivatives we have to take. Um, so we, has, we um, assume that we already computed uh, the derivative of e with respect to b. That's the kind of the backward pass through the graph. And now we have to compute derivative of b with respect to a. So let's just come up with a even mathematically even simpler function there. Let's say b is a square node that just takes the square of the input values. So this is the forward calculation. Then the backward calculation is this here. Um, so, so this is what we have to do in our computation graph. We always have to compute um, the derivative with respect to um, of, of any node with respect to its previous. So at the L2 node, we basically have here, one way to put it is the derivative L2 values that come out there to respect to the sigmoid node values. Uh, another way, we're going to mathematically make this a little bit simpler, but just call it always derivative of the output given the input at this particular node. Um, this is the L2 norm, um, so this is uh, the derivative, that's the calculation of the L2 norm, one half times t minus input, t is this here, squared, and the derivative of that is t minus one, t, t minus i, sorry. So basically, that's the derivative calculation there. So we'll do this now for every node. This is the sigmoid, uh, which you yeah, uh, went over some detail about why that is the derivative of the sigmoid. Um, this is the sum. Oh, that's kind of interesting because we basically need to now take two derivatives, one with respect to the, the, the b values here and one with respect to the prod. So there are two different paths we have to further go up. So. Uh, the derivative of the sum with respect to the prod, well, that is the derivative output with respect to input number one. And uh, 
it is the sum of these two values um, since i2 and s respect is a constant falls out this is really just one so there's not really all that much happening here um, the product uh, similar that you have two inputs for that that you're interested in uh, w2 and and uh, the weight matrix 2 and the sig um, the values in the sigma node so we also have these two things so let's do the derivative of the um, product with respect to the sigmoid that is uh, derivative of the output given with respect to input number one it's now a product so these are actually then the values of of input number two and uh, the other calculation is going the opposite direction and so on so um, these are our functions here and uh, let's now actually carry out the computation so we just wrote in here the functions that we computed for the derivatives so the prod indicates what the forward calculation was in blue in purple it's the derivatives at this point that we need for the backward calculation let's now apply this to the actual numbers that we had in our example of processing this particular input here so again in blue we have the forward calculations uh, and we now also have in purple the operations that we have to do at each individual node so we start here at the bottom with um, the error term and it says here i2 minus i1 uh, what is i2 i2 is 1.0 and i1 is this here so we subtract the two and that's it next step up it says take uh, the derivative of the segment and apply it to the input value so the input value here is um, 1.18 that's the input value and we can apply the derivative of the sigma to it we also have to multiply it with the downstream um, error that we back propagate here so this is the gradient from the downstream processing that gives us this value so just to be perfectly clear about what's happening here so remember we have here functions that we chain together um, where one of the functions here is the sigmoid and the other one is the l2 norm so these are our two functions so when we talk about these functions um, here function f is a subsequent function l2 and g is the sigmoid so we first apply the sigmoid then we apply the l2 norm so we're interested in the derivatives here and our magic formula said this should be the derivatives of function f applied to uh, the g x um, so the first function with multiplied with the derivative of f uh, of g divide applied to x so maybe use a little bit nicer colors here to see what we're doing here um, so here we know talking about um, uh, derivative functions and uh, here is the other derivative function and uh, in blue are the forward values so the values we have there are here what is g this is uh, our sigmoid function what it's applied to this x here is applied to this value and this is here already x uh, uh, passed through the function of the sigmoid so this is this value 
So we have these two calculations. One is uh, fully already carried out beforehand. So this calculation down here, uh, we, um, uh, so this calculation here, we already fully carried out. This was what gave us this number here. And this is the new calculation here that we have to do. And this is what gave us this number. So we multiply. Next calculation is very easy. We don't have to do anything. We just copy over the value. So we just multiply one with this here. And we do this in both directions, for both of these gradients. So remember, we're computing one gradient with respect to this and one gradient with respect to that. And uh, that gives us then these two, two gradients. And so on and so on and so on. So we always have a multiplication of the downstream value that we computed with then whatever this calculation tells us at any given point in time. This gives us all these numbers. Uh, we don't care about all of these numbers at the end. We care about the numbers that are associated with made matrices and vectors. So we not ca actually care about all these gradients we computed. We only care about uh, the gradients that computed that are relevant for updating parameters. So for instance, this is a parameter that we have to update. And this is the relevant gradient value that we computed for that. This here is a parameter that we have to update. And these are the relevant gradient values, and so on. OK. So this is the same thing where we just omitted all the uh, intermediate computed gradients, and we're only left with the gradients that are actually relevant for updates. And what's the last thing we do is we're going to turn that into an update process. Um, this is kind of the optimization stuff we actually do to improve our neural network. And uh, we said uh, we move against the gradient, and we scale that with a learning rate. OK, so this was the more theoretical description of how computation chains work and how the computing of the derivatives is a fairly mechanical process that can be done automatically. So let's actually now work through how to actually implement that in uh, toolkits that are out there. So there's an explosion of deep learning toolkits, uh, an early one was uh, called Theano from the University of Montreal. It's now defunct. They stopped developing it already a couple of years ago. Uh, Google is pushing something called TensorFlow. Another very popular one is PyTorch. This is the one we're actually going to go over here. Microsoft is developing a toolkit. Amazon is developing a toolkit. There were also toolkits that were specifically built for neural machine translation. There's uh, still active development as of now at uh, Carnegie Mellon University on something called Dynet. And there's also an implementation that was purely done for neural machine translation and uh, kind of natively built in C++ called Marion. It's also still around, uh, was originally uh, um, uh, developed at a Polish university and uh, University of Edinburgh, but the lead developer has now moved to Microsoft and is developing it there. And this is actually the production system. And there are many more. Um, one notable fact about this is this is a very dynamic field. I have presented this set of slides in three different classes. This is now the third time uh, in a machine translation class here at Johns Hopkins. And this is the third different toolkit I'm going to talk over each time the toolkit changed. I first talked about um, Theano, then I talked about Dynet, and now I'm going to talk about PyTorch. So hopefully that has some stability, but uh, maybe not. But the principles are not all that different for these different toolkits. So what do they do? So um, having machine learning architectures around computation graphs is very powerful. So all you have to do is define a computation graph basically saying there's some inputs. These are probably calculations that's going to help you to produce the output. Here's some parameter values that you have to learn to do that well. And it could be as simple as a feed-forward neural network. Um, 
then you only have to provide train, uh, training data and uh, training strategy and the toolkit does the rest. It also allows seamless support of GPUs. It's typically just even an environment variable you set or a switch you set and say, now run this whole thing on a GPU. So we do PyTorch. Um, all you have to do to use PyTorch is um, uh, in, uh, it's a library for Python. So you install it with pip install torch. And then when you write code, the first line of code has to be import torch. So PyTorch has data types for parameter vectors, matrices, and so on that are called torch tensor. So this is uh, the data type for uh, parameter vector uh, matrix here. So here has the values in it. Here we specify that it uh, we actually care about the gradients. So we want to compute the gradients for that. That's something we want to get out of it. And um, here's a specification that the underlying uh, data type for the values is floating point numbers. So this is the, uh, these three things here are the uh, parameters of the feedforward neural network that I've been using throughout here. And uh, here is the input and uh, uh, input value is one, one input value and one output value of the example we worked over now several times uh, with different views. Here's a computation graph. So the computation graph is basically, um, it can be really written down as mathematical functions. So we have the, the matrix multiplication here of uh, the weight matrix W with input vector X and adding in the bias term. Um, so this multiplication here is a little bit specified as a multiplication between a matrix and a vector. Um, contrast this to the second multiplication we do uh, where uh, we actually just gonna apply the dot product. Um, so there we only have two vectors. W2 is not really a matrix, it's also a vector. So we actually just do a dot, dot product of these two vector multiplications. So when you define this computation chance, it requires you to be a bit aware about uh, what uh, what the what the different variables are are the matrices uh, what's the meaning of the different dimension in the matrix and so on. Another thing to keep in mind is this is not actually carrying out a calculation. This defines a computation graph. It's written like it's carrying out a calculation, but it really defines a graph. So what happens when you write down this kind of code is that a graph structure is built of calculations and how they tie to each other and uh, probably also slots to store values and slots to store derivatives. The backward calculation, the one that we agonize so much about it is that's it. It's just, you say, do the backward. So we don't have to worry about how the gradients are being computed for all these different steps that we just set out. Uh, since we're using elementary steps of the toolkit, the toolkit already knows what the gradients are for these steps and it knows then how to chain all this together. So we can just say, do the backward calculation. That's it. Um, so if we do this for this particular calculation here, we can actually uh, also then check what the gradients are um, at the different values. And uh, one note is when you run this code that we just showed here, multiple times it just accumulates the gradients over time. So you have to reset them. So this is a way to reset the gradients. Okay, so let's actually work all the way through of uh, training the neural network. Uh, these are all the different input values that we want to present to it. So it's XOR, so 0, 0, output 1, 0, 0, 1, output 1, 1, 0, output 1, 
when one outputs zero. So we're gonna write this down in into an array here. Uh, where we say each of these is a tensor, that's a very simple vector. So uh, these are the input values, these are the output values. We always pair together the input values and the output values here. And um, here is then the training loop. So there are actually two loops involved. One is we're going to loop here a thousand times over the entire training data. So a thousand times is a lot, uh, but also we have tiny amounts of training data. Um, for neural machine translation models, typically we run over 10, maybe 100 epochs, depending a lot on how much data we have. The more data we have, the less frequent you have to go over the entire training data. Okay, so that's the one loop. The other loop here uh, in our implementation here, where we just keep things very simple, we just loop over each item in the training data. So, uh, so we loop through the training data. So this was an array of training examples, and we're going to pull out uh, each of the inputs and outputs. And um, this is the forward calculation. So this is kind of identical to what we had earlier. So this is just kind of going through this forward calculation. This is the backward calculation. And then, as I said, we can just pull out the gradients uh, for each of these weight matrices and vectors that we defined. MU is our learning rate, and this is the update. Once we're done with this, we have to zero out all the gradients, and we're going to go to the next training example. Here at the end, after each iteration, this also reports the error. So if you run this, you can see kind of the error slowly going down. So we computed gradients for each training example and updated the model immediately. However, it's more common to process examples in batches and update after a batch is being processed. So uh, one way you could do this in this code in a somewhat crude way is um, to, instead of having this arrow backward after each training example, is to kind of we also computed a total error over all the training examples and do the backward step over that so basically move all the weight update stuff out of this loop maybe i should go back to the cl class here so we did all this here within the loop for a training example but we could move all that down here where we uh, uh, after we added up all the errors so Remember here we multiplied up and we added up all the errors. Um, and if you add up all the errors, and then we can move this out of the loop, and then we can do an update over the entire training data. So that's a bit of an extreme batch update of basically just having an update over after processing all training examples. But it's more common is that you have a subset of the training examples that you do the updates over. And the size of the upsets, it seems to be the bigger is better, um, but you have to then compute all the values for them and keep them together. And then there's often memory constraints in the GPU that restrict that a bit. Anyway, um, so you have to basically, uh, to make this a bit more efficient, is to present then all the training examples at the same time. So here we basically put together all the, all the training examples into um, a, a, an array of inputs, an array of outputs, and we're going to compute now, have now computations that run over the entire batch of training examples. So we don't process one example at a time, we process the entire batch. So we process all these inputs here at the same time. This allows us to make much better use of the ability to parallelize these calculations on a GPU. So now the input again is actually a whole matrix because each input itself is a vector and now we have a set of these vectors that are stringed together into a matrix. 
So this changes some of these operations here. So the input now X is a matrix too. So this now becomes a matrix matrix calculation. And down here is also what we previously had just a dot product as now a matrix vector calculation. Um, otherwise, everything stays more or less the same. Um, one more thing is this is our error calculation. So this computes then a vector of errors. So for a change training example, it's going to get the error, but we're not actually interested in really particularly each training example's error. We're interested in the overall error, and this is a function that takes this vector of uh, errors and turns them into a single number, which we then can do the backward step over. So here we just kind of made our life easy by just batching up all the training data into one single batch. As I said, it's more common to uh, divide the training data into several batches, where the size is usually then limited by how much you can fit on GPU memory. Because as you can see here, um, we're putting all the inputs in at the same time. We do all the calculations at the same time. OK, one more thing is about the parameter updates, the optimizer. So we had very explicit code how we do the optimization. So this is gradient descent training. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the simplest way of doing updates. Uh, so this is just taking the gradients, multiplying with the learning rate, and this is how you update uh, the weight ranges. But typically, more fancier optimizers are used, things like Atom and so on. We went over that in some detail in the previous lectures. Um, to support things like Atom uh, requires a bit more complex implementation in PyTorch. So to enable that, we need to define our neural network as an object that derives from torch and n module. So in that object, we have all um, its uh, calculations and uh, parameter values. So these are all the initial parameter values, which we are still kind of specifying by hand. Uh, in, in actual realities, these will be set to randomized values at the beginning. And uh, here, our calculations they now look much, much simpler um, because uh, we can use uh, kind of built-in functions uh, to do this uh, combination of bias terms, et cetera. Um, OK, so here is the, um, the forward calculation of um, both carrying out the weighted sum, but also adding in the bias. So picture these layers. If we specify this as the calculation, which says here the dimensions of the inputs of the output, and we specify the weight matrix and the bias term for each of the layers. That's the uh, also called affine transform. And here is then the activation function. OK. So um, that just defines an abstract object. When we actually run code, we have to instantiate that object. And this is how we then instantiate what the optimizer is. So this is an optimizer, which also is kind of a standard optimizer. And we optimize it on the parameters of the neural network. Here we specify the learning rate. So this is um, doing stochastic gradient descent with a learning rate of 0 0.1. If you want to switch it to more complex things like Atom, then uh, you just have to specify a different optimizer. OK, here's now, the, just for completeness sake, uh, the training loop with having this as an object. So it looks a bit easier because we don't explicitly have to do the optimization anymore. So we first also have to opt zero out all the gradients. So we optimize, uh, we set the optimizer uh, to zero out its gradients. This is the forward calculation. Uh, what the forward calculation actually is, is in the neural network object. This is our error calculation. 
this is how we compute the mean of the error. We kind of report it here. And this is the backward step. This computes all the gradients. And then the optimizer steps applies these computed gradients to update parameters. So the code I showed here is actually available on the web page for the textbook. If you go to the following URL, and I really encourage you to kind of download that code, play with it, get a feel for how to build uh, neural networks with toolkits like PyTorch. Okay, and that's it for today.